Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Hardcore Survival Guide. Let's fix this door. I was tinkering around with the redstone in a creative test world and came upon a pretty simple fix. For that though, we will need a cleric. Or alternatively, a piece of glowstone which clerics trade. But it doesn't seem like we have a cleric in this village, so this village must have spawned without a brewing stand nearby. I don't recall seeing a cleric amongst the villagers here and there is no tall church building, which means we do need to go back to the nether. This time around though, we are going to go to the nether the normal way, which means first I need to gather some obsidian so that I can build myself a portal. And since we didn't have any lava lakes particularly close to the village, I'm gonna staircase down here. We might end up hitting the abandoned mineshaft at some point, but I'm fairly certain that down here, yeah, there we go, we should be able to find ourselves a lava lake. And if not a lava lake, then potentially a ravine, although ravines are pretty deadly in hardcore worlds. You really really don't want to mess with ravines if you can help it, on account of the dark spaces and ledges up here being spawning area for creepers which can drop on you and immediately detonate. And with very little time to react and pull up your shield, you are pretty much a goner at that point. Luckily for me, this mineshaft has other sources of lava, so I'm just going to create a few obsidian blocks from the lava sources in the walls here and we'll see how much we end up with. Naturally, a lava source is another of the more deadly things you can find down here and we really don't want to tangle with lava if we can possibly help it. So. I'm being a little bit conservative with what I'm doing down here, and we're also still in need of a decent food source. Incredibly, this mineshaft also goes through a third geode, which I had honestly thought was one of the geodes that we passed through before, but no, this is actually a completely different one. So we are going to have our work cut out for ourselves, making a massive amethyst farm in this abandoned mineshaft. I don't think I've really seen three geodes in such close proximity before. Once again, not really what we're here for though, and you know what, I'm gonna dig down a little bit further at the end of this part of the mineshaft, because if we reach Y11, which we should do if we keep going down here, we'll be pretty much guaranteed to run into a lava lake at that point. And it turns out that this abandoned mineshaft goes in a bunch of different directions. I think it's really the second mineshaft overlapping with the first that has kind of caused this to go way further down. But there's a spot over here where we can drop down into a more natural cave, and that seems like a more likely spot that we would find a giant lava lake, so I think we're probably going to take our chances down here with the meager supply of torches that I have. I can probably craft a couple more from the wood planks and some coal from the surroundings. And I need to be very careful here because we're low on food, so I'm going to try my best to not take damage in this next area. We can always top up with rotten flesh if we need to. Oh, and look at this. Right down at the bottom of this section of the cave, we found ourselves some diamonds clustered together with some coal and redstone ore. That's a nice find. We can eat a little bit of rotten flesh if we need to. Rotten flesh will give you that hunger debuff for 30 seconds, but it doesn't do it 100% of the time. And in a pinch, if you need to regenerate some health, it's better to just stand still, let the hunger debuff happen, and your saturation will go down, but then your hunger won't decrease any further if you are standing still. Now, I'm pretty certain I I heard the telltale pop of lava around here, so I think we're going to try digging a little bit further down. Once we get to Y11, hopefully we will come across a lava lake. There we go, we broke through the wall into it, and it was at Y11 after all. So what happens apparently in cave generation is that caves will still generate below Y11, but they just get filled up with lava below a certain point. So if this was meant to be a like tunnel-like cave, it's basically been filled up with lava when world generation happens. And we're going to gather all of this obsidian the safest way I know how, by standing in a water source, because that will flow over the lava, preventing any obsidian from falling into lava sources below it, and also means that we don't catch on fire if any lava happens to come in our direction. On our way back, we're going to shoot a couple of pigs with a flame bow so that we can get hold of some pork chops, and chances are we might run into a hoglin or two once we're in the nether, so a little bit more cooked pork and maybe some cooked beef as well won't go too far amiss. And I think once we've got the door fixed up here, we are going to work on a storage system, because right now, this is all over the place. <laughs> I kind of can't stand it, because seriously, the chests aren't in any kind of organized setup. There's one behind there that's probably going to be covered up by the decor in here. Really, this is all just a giant mess. Let's go to the nether. Once again, I'm going to put the portal a little bit away from the village, and this time not necessarily for the villagers' protection, just because I find it kind of noisy, but we'll build up the sides three blocks tall on this side, three blocks tall on that side. We'll do four across the top, and that's our nether portal 
all fixed up. Let's see where this puts us out, because I don't think it's going to connect to that portal in the Tiger, which means we could be in hot water pretty quickly. But it looks like we are actually just in a different part of the same ravine structure. We are at Y66 this time, though, so we're a little bit higher up. But immediately over there, I see what I came in here for in the first place. We're going to get hold of some glowstone. And we're going to do that a little carefully because we are still in a crimson forest. If you've got silk touch, that's a good idea to use on glowstone because it will drop the entire block. But if you've got fortune, the glowstone dust it drops is usually enough that you can reform the glowstone block. And if you don't have enough, then you can always just break a couple more blocks. In this case, I got hold of eight blocks of glowstone. All we need is one, but we're going to make a redstone lamp out of that. And that's what we're going to use to fix our hobbit hold door. And just like that, we're out of the nether and back to our little hobbit homestead. So we're going to take out these blocks here. And I think what we're going to do is take out the redstone torch for now. We're going to remove that as well. And I believe last time we went to the nether, we did bring back a decent amount of quartz. So we have enough of this to make an observer. We're also going to grab four redstone dust so we can craft a redstone lamp. The observer needs two more redstone dust, some cobblestone and one quartz. We're going to place the lamp here. We're going to place the observer facing into the lamp in that direction and now when we press this block it pulses twice okay that's perfect so what this is going to do is detach the block from the sticky piston because it's going to receive a one tick pulse from the observer detecting an update to that lamp but the lamp switches on for a second or two and because it's a wooden button the pulse length is a little bit longer than a stone button so our exit button can go next to this and it will still activate the redstone lamp here the block on the outside is also powering this redstone lamp when we press the button in the middle of the door and what that does is the observer detects the lamp going on it doesn't do anything for a second and then it detects the lamp going off again meaning we have adequate time to walk outside and the door closes behind us. Same deal when we go in, we just hit that button, we walk on through the door, and then the door closes behind us again. That's perfect. I think that worked out pretty well, if only it was made out of warped wood. And yes, I saw that people in the comments had left me at the location of a warped forest, but I kind of prefer to explore that stuff myself, even though I've given out the seed for this world. That's really for you guys in the comments to discuss the location of stuff that you want to find, or to just explore the world in your own time. I'm really about exploring a world organically, so I'm going to ignore anybody who's left any coordinates for stuff in the comments. Just let me find that stuff on my own in this series. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time digging out the area inside of here because I want to make a permanent storage system or at least a storage system that's going to last us for now because yeah we really need to get some permanent chests in here we can move all of our stuff over from the blacksmith's house that I've been living out of and realistically we are going to need a lot of storage for stuff and the hobbit hole seems like an ideal place to do that because we can just dig into the hillside carve out whatever space we need and build the entire thing here I am also kind of considering getting rid of the iron golem because he is starting to annoy me and I don't want to hit him and end up with him killing me by mistake. Anyway, I'm going to spend a little bit of time digging. We're going to create effectively a central hallway with rooms branching off to either side and that's going to form the foundation of our storage system. Hey folks, welcome back. So the interior of my hobbit hole is slowly coming together. I'm really quite happy with the hallway area right now. We've got that lovely curved feature that seems to be the inside of the hobbit holes, at least from the movies of Lord of the Rings. There's a really nice detail in the ceiling here. We've got some moss with glow berries hanging down from it. And these are all age 25 now, so they won't grow down any further than they already have. And we just bone mealed a couple of those in formation. So it looks like a nice little glowing lamp is hanging from the ceiling. Kind of wreathed in leaves, I guess. I wasn't sure quite how much light this was going to provide for the interior, though. So I did sneak in a few glowstone blocks underneath the carpet. Carpet will let light through where blocks like slabs and stuff won't, at least on Java edition they won't, so it was kind of important to me to make sure that we had some light at floor level, because obviously light in the ceiling is going to decay as it gets closer to the floor, so by the time a light level of 12 reaches the floor it's travelled three blocks and is a light level of 9, and as it travels further outwards it's going to decrease until it hits 7, and then 7 is when mobs start to spawn, so we need to make sure that we at least had some lighting around the floor to make sure this area stayed well lit enough that I'm not going to be surprised by creepers in my own house. Now, we have started on a storage system here, and I thought I would show you some of the redstone that's going to go into the left-hand side of it, the uh, north wing, I guess, of the uh, hobbit hole here, because this is where we're going to start storing bulk items, basically the kind of stuff that I'm going to acquire in large quantities. We could expand this as far as we wanted to that way, so we can expand it as we start to acquire some more stuff. But to start with, we're going to be going with basic kind of stuff like wood types on this side, 
and stone types on that side. We're using a lot of wood in our buildings right now. We've got a lot of different wood types going on here. And at the very least, I want storage for dark oak, oak and spruce logs to basically all go in here. On the right hand side, of course, we're going to have things like natural stone, cobblestone, andesite, diorite and so forth and so forth. Basically, all of the stuff that we're going to be getting on a regular basis if we go caving or if we go chopping some wood, which I tend to do quite frequently. And then on the right hand side, we're going to have manual storage laid out in a similar fashion. So for every chest over here that has, you know, a type of wood in it, like oak or whatever, we're going to have one on this side that has all of the different things you can craft with oak. And that's all going to be manually sorted, mostly to save a little bit of time. But I can give you some tips and tricks on how to organize that stuff a little faster. But since I've started on the storage filters here, I've already built two of them already, just to check I remembered how to do it. I figured I would get you guys on camera for this part and we could go through the storage filter circuit and why it works the way it does and why I build it a certain way. Because there are a few different ways you can change up this circuit if you've built it in certain places, but it makes the most sense to me to build it this way. So we're going to start off by placing our storage chest there. That's resting on top of a hopper, which is taking all of the contents of this chest and just bringing it into a chest which is going to be either at ground level or maybe we'll make the walkway here out of slabs so that we'll be at kind of like halfway buried into the ground for the chest that you actually take the items out of. Above that, we're going to be placing one hopper right there. And then we're going to be building this framework, which I'll break the wall away a little bit here so you can see. We want three blocks of netherrack along the top. Diagonally to the right, we want one block there. We need to make sure there's a block to place the repeaters on and then a block in front of that for this redstone torch to go on. You can find all of these recipes in the crafting recipe book if you don't know how to make them already. I better sleep because the villagers might get attacked by zombies. Just did a quick check outside. Everybody seems to be fine. So anyway, back to this netherrack shape. The whole reason I'm building it out of netherrack in the first place is so that it's an obviously different block to the surrounding environment. You can of course place these components on any blocks but it makes sense to build it out of something that you've got a lot of, like netherrack in this case having been to the nether and done a lot of tunneling, and also something that's going to stand out so that when you're breaking blocks around it you don't accidentally break the blocks that have your redstone components on. So to start the circuit off up here we're going to be placing a redstone comparator. Comparators do a number of things but one of their main functions is to to detect the contents of a hopper or any kind of container, anything that's got a an inventory of sorts, and to output a redstone signal based on how full that inventory is. So if I was to fill up this hopper completely with items, then that would mean the comparator outputted the strongest possible redstone signal strength, which is a strength of 15. What this circuit does is fill it up with enough items to create a fairly low signal strength and then lock the hopper underneath it so that items cannot travel through. To do that, we place two redstone dust there and one more on this lower block. Then we're going to come down here, place the redstone repeater facing in that direction and have a redstone torch on this block here. The redstone torch, while it is on, and all three of these redstone torches currently are, powers the block above it. And powering that block actually locks this hopper, which is the one that inputs the items into the chest, making sure that nothing can be taken from this hopper above. Now, it's quite important that the hoppers are facing towards the comparators here. See, the output of this hopper is facing in towards the comparator because hoppers can both pull and push. When you lock a hopper, you are locking its pull function, but not its push function. And if it's able to push those items downward, it will, so the circuit isn't effective. What we do is reroute the output towards the comparator here, which it can't push items into. And what that means is the hopper underneath has to pull the items out, and while it is locked, it cannot do that, freezing the items in place in this hopper up here. What this circuit does when we put enough items in this hopper is increase the signal strength coming out of this comparator to three, meaning it powers this block here with the signal from this line of redstone dust. The power from this block gets detected by the repeater, which powers the block in front of it, which switches off the redstone torch. And what that does is unlock the hopper and allow items to flow through. Once the signal strength drops low enough because the items have emptied out of this top hopper, the circuit will turn off and the redstone torch will turn back on, locking the hopper again. So for example, if I put 53 redstone torches in here, we can watch those drain away into the hopper. Once they reach 41, they will stop because 45 items in this hopper is exactly the amount at which the comparator stops outputting a signal strength of three and the signal strength drops back down to two. In the meantime, all of the redstone torches have drained into the chest below and there might still be one stored in this hopper. And what this means is we have 42 of the item in question basically locked up in the system. So people might be wondering, why do you not put more items 
in this top hopper. Why, for example, do you not fill the netherrack portion of this hopper up with a bunch more items, allowing the rest of the redstone torches to drain on through? For example, if there are 11 items in each of those spaces and the item that we want to filter in that first space, it does drain down to one. That means there are 52 redstone torches here in the output chest, and surely that's better than having them all locked up in the system. Well, not exactly, because each of these circuits is built next to each other, and the redstone dust all connects here at the back. This is what's called a tileable redstone circuit. You can basically build a bunch of them all in a row, and the fact that the redstone dust connects at the back here is a problem if you start to put more items into the hopper. Let's say I input a bunch of redstone torches at once, and those start draining through. You'll notice now that the redstone wire has lit up to the point where it's activating this circuit next to this hopper. So the items are draining out of this hopper, but if we hop down here, it's also deactivated the redstone torch in the circuit next to it. For the sake of example, let's say that this circuit is filtering diorite, and I put a bunch of cobblestone in there as a filler item. If we now put a bunch of redstone torches in here, and this first item slot gets up to a stack, plus all of the extra netherrack in here, what that's going to do is start draining all of the items out of the hopper next door, and unfortunately Unfortunately, what that means is it breaks our item filter circuit. Whatever items are being transferred in through a feed line or a hopper minecart or a water stream, items that come in start getting collected in this hopper until sooner or later, that hopper is just filtering all of the random junk that gets thrown into your storage system and the whole thing breaks, meaning that miscellaneous items end up in this chest instead of the resource you're trying to filter. Now let's do this properly because I intend to keep the filter circuits the same way after this. We're actually going to rename a bunch of netherrack items here and we're going to call this filler material. The reason we rename these items is so that if I accidentally put some netherrack into the system, it doesn't get filtered down because it doesn't stack with the rest of the netherrack that's in here. If I try and stack some of these other netherrack items in that first space, it won't occupy the same stack as the netherrack that was already there because this one is renamed and Minecraft sees that as a different item. So now finally we get to add oak logs to this first filter slice and that is where we're going to be storing our oak logs. I'm probably going to make some sort of system on the floor here or label this area to show exactly what's being stored in each chest but now with that filter slice active we've got a bunch of oak logs starting to come into the system and of course the netherrack that I just took out of the chest there. We're going to be making multiple modules of this. We're probably going to start with at least six on each side, potentially eight because there are eight different types of wood in Minecraft. So I think maybe we'll start there and sooner or later we'll be able to fill up one of those with warped wood. But I hope that explainer on filter circuits has proved somewhat useful to some of you. And if you've got any questions, of course, leave them in the comments because I'll be happy to answer them. All right, so the storage is coming along. I still haven't quite figured out what I want to do with this right hand wing. So I'm going to leave that one for this episode. However, our automated side of things is looking splendid. And I still need to run the hopper feed line along the top. But honestly, I'm waiting for some iron to smelt. I spent a little while running around trying to find some iron, realized I had some raw iron in here. But hoppers are expensive. And even fortuning all of this iron in the early game, we still have a heck of a lot of iron to get hold of. So for now, I thought I would show you guys this. This is the brand new addition to sign readability in 1.17, and that comes in the form of glow ink, which I actually, thankfully, have some of around here. And yes, my inventory is still a mess, even though I'm working on a storage system. It's okay. So I've already done this once, and that already got me an advancement, glow and behold, for making the text of a sign glow. But basically how this works is you right-click a written sign with glow ink. It makes a very squelchy noise. I like glow ink sack splotches, it says in the subtitles. And then that outlines the text now. So no longer does text have to be this single, you know, fairly thin font, it actually gets a solid white outline, which makes it much more readable. Not only that, but if we come out here and grab some dye, I'll grab some blue and yellow here, for example, and then we use those dyes on the sign, it changes the color. Not only does it change the color of the text itself, but it also colors the outline. So we could color code these if we wanted to. Wow, that is, that is luminous. That is certainly a decision. Now my question is, if we then dye this black, does it make the border white again? Is the default text black or is it something else? Do I have any black dye anywhere? <laughs> well, it turns out I don't, but luckily I have a squid in the river and I also have a librarian. 
in the river? What what are you what are you doing in the river? <laughs> Going for a swim, I guess. All right, now the workday has started. He seems to be wandering back in the direction of his workstation. <laughs> Hope you had a good swim, buddy. <laughs> Sorry if you got your robes a bit wet. But we got a bit of that squid ink, which we can turn into black dye. And yes, it does. Okay, so obviously the black on black border would make things a little bit unreadable. So clearly the default text is this dark text with a white border. I like that a lot. And now we get to color all of these in a very, very readable fonts. And that's gonna look great if we end up doing more fun stuff with that in future. And I've seen some really creative uses of the different colors as well. So we've got all of the different wood types here, all eight of the wood types. Uh, obviously I haven't even seen a jungle yet. We haven't been to a savannah to get acacia and we still are missing the warped stem. But on the other side, I figured we would add a few of the more commonly acquired materials from the natural world. So we've got cobblestone. Naturally, we're gonna be getting a lot of that when we go mining with a pick that doesn't have silk touch of course natural stone is going to be in there as well because i get a lot of that later and then we can craft that into stone brick and whatever else and a site diorite and granite sort of deserved to be here because you will acquire a lot of them while you're mining and then i figured dirt we could put the dirt variants up here in these barrels which are not linked to the automated hopper fed system in any way we also got one for moss and one for netherrack, because of course we'll be tunneling a lot in the nether, acquiring a lot of netherrack, and I think we're going to be doing a fair amount with moss this season as well. I expect moss is going to feature heavily, and it's already made for some lovely accent walls and carpet features and all kinds of stuff here in the hobbit hole. I've even tucked a couple of azalea shrubs around here, and I think moss and glowstone go really nicely together as well. So I'm learning a few color combinations here, learning what I like about the moss in builds like this rather than just as a you know decorative organic block how it can fit into interior landscapes as well there is obviously still a lot left to do here in the hobbit hole i haven't really renovated the library or this is probably going to be the parlor and i'll have to wall that off from all of the storage system stuff but i think we have made a really good start here and i'm very excited that we have a little bit of automated storage up and running now once again a hopper feed line going all the way around this or maybe even a hopper minecart feeding in from a chest that we're actually going to drop into the roof of the hobbit hole we'll do that another time though because i'll be farming lots of trees up there but for now that is going to be it for this episode of the hardcore survival guide i'm going to turn away from back here because every now and then when i do my outro i do this little like flick thing where i i, I tap the left click button occasionally and i'm worried that if i hit the iron golem he is going to kill me so once again i have a feeling we're going to have to watch out for him but thank you so much for watching this episode of the hardcore survival guide my name has been pixel riffs don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.